Nebraska might have come up a little short in Mickey Joseph's first game in charge, but that doesn't mean he's taking this job lightly. Some interim head coaches know their time's limited and just try to hold the locker room together so there'll be enough guys on the roster by their next game. But Mickey's as involved and committed to this team as we could hope for. He takes responsibility for losses, has expectations as high as ours, and even bounces coaches out who don't fit in with what he believes to be the standard for this program. And sure, winning a game at this point might feel like a miracle, but we still got nine of them left. So today, we're going to talk about the loss against Oklahoma, talk about some realistic expectations for Mickey Joseph, I'll give you my thoughts on Eric Shenander being fired as defensive coordinator, and at the end, I'll share my experience from my trip to Lincoln this weekend. But what's up guys, I'm Connor Hayden, and this is Corn Craze. If you're a fan of Nebraska or the Big Ten, make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss any of my content about potential head coaches. And if you're glad Mickey made a change on D, go ahead and hit that like button below to help us get to a thousand. But now, let's get into it. If Saturday was your first time watching Nebraska this season, then Brent Venables gave you a pretty good idea of how bad things have gotten. It's normal to see backups come in when there's a blowout, but Venables had his starters out by the third quarter, and he had to try his best not to score more than 50 points just to leave Mickey's team with a little bit of dignity and some hope that maybe they can still beat an Indiana or a Rutgers. Their top two running backs carried the ball 24 times and combined for over 8 yards per carry. The four leading receivers combined for 12 catches and averaged over 17 yards a catch, and even though Dylan Gabriel had some Adrian Martinez-like accuracy issues, the defense made him look like a Heisman contender. Some of us still had hope left after Frost got fired. We thought maybe it was a game planning issue, or maybe the players just didn't want to play for the guy. but. It's clear now that it runs so much deeper than that. In the post-game presser, Mickey said this loss was on him, which is cool because we've seen coaches in the past place blame other places instead of accepting responsibility for their own shortcomings. Miles Farmer stepped in and said that's just coach talk and that the players are the ones who lost that game. But Miles and Mickey are both wrong because neither of them can accept full responsibility for losing to the number six team in the country. Let's keep it real and place blame where it belongs. Scott Frost had his staff in place for five seasons and guys weren't leaving for better jobs or for more money obviously since they were failing in their roles anyway. So he had no excuse not to make the changes that he felt were important. He just chose not to because he was stubborn or because he was ridiculously loyal or maybe he was just too blind to see what was actually happening. This program had no identity when Mickey came in nine months ago and the team still couldn't define that going into the first game in Ireland. So Mickey's not allowed to accept responsibility for that loss. Cause just like Mike Riley left his successor with a mess, Frost is leaving his with the same. Only this mess is worse. Coach JB was DMing me jokes about our talent yesterday and hitting me with the I told you so comments, but I'm still not buying that cause these players are not bad at football. They're just not trained properly. You cannot tell me that the guys on defense are taking bad angles and missing tackles like crazy because they're not good players. Those are basic fundamental mistakes that have plagued every position group on this entire team for Frost's entire run. And Mickey acknowledged they're going to get back to teaching the fundamentals of football and thank God for his sake and the players, he's got a bye week to work on it. Now let's talk about three realistic expectations that we can set for this staff for the rest of the season. Number one, the tackling to improve. The team tackled in practice last week, but Miles Farmer told reporters they've been tagging off in practice for the last four years. So how much improvement can you expect after just a couple days? And they looked good at the start of the last game, but sure enough, the problems came back and Nebraska finished with a total of 16 missed throughout the day. Since this is probably the number one most important skill you can possess as a player, especially in the Big Ten where guys are huge and hard to bring down, I can say with certainty that this is going to be a main focus in practices coming up. Number two, a new talent evaluation. 
With Teddy out for the season at left tackle, the coaches have to figure out what starting five combo will give Casey the best chance to get the ball out before he takes a hit. And we saw multiple backups get significant playing time this week, and Mickey said they're going to continue to make adjustments to see who gives them the best chance to win now. Scott Frost had his favorites, but this staff's still coaching for their future, so they'll ride with whoever's playing the hardest and whoever's the most consistent regardless of their potential or their relationships. And number three, a commitment to doing whatever's best for these players and this program this season. Yesterday, Mickey decided it was time to let Shenander go after four abysmal games, and I don't think there's one fan in the state who wasn't happy with that news. Here's the thing, the staff might not be here past November, but they're not going to stand by and let these players get embarrassed by every offense they face this season just because they're running out of options to fill the open positions. Recruits commit to a school, not a staff, and when they commit, they're trusting the leaders at that school to do what's in their best interest for their entire stay. Trev and Mickey understand that better than anybody, so constant change until they find a winning formula is inevitable. And that brings us to the firing of Chins as defensive coordinator. And I never want a guy to lose his job or for anyone to have to go through getting fired because I'm sure he was trying his best, but if we're going to keep it real, he sucked at it. In the last two games, the D gave up 94 points, over 1,200 yards of offense, and only came away with two sacks. And you've got to remember, they have Garrett Nelson and O'Shawn Mathis this year, who were both NFL-level pass rushers before this season started. Right now, Nebraska's ranked 114th in points allowed per game, 124th in run defense, and 115th in pass D. That's not only unacceptable, that's an abomination. That's comparable to the Callahan defense that gave up 76 points to Kansas. And yeah, I was just as upset about that when I was 11 years old as I have been with Chins this entire month. For all the talk about losing key guys off last year's unit, this D has multiple all-conference players in the starting lineup and plenty of guys who'd be successful at other Power 5 programs. And today, they're one of the four worst defenses in the country, only in front of Akron, Bowling Green, and Charlotte, after playing a terrible Northwestern team, an FCS school, and Georgia Southern who could barely score on UAB. So if you adjust their total defense ranking based on the schedule, they might actually have the worst defense in all of college football. People say Frost defrauded the program by taking all that money for nothing, but damn, at least that dude still managed to field a decent offense even with terrible line play the entire time he was here. I think the biggest reason so many of us were hopeful for this team was because of the progress the D had made over the past four seasons. It seemed like they always got a little bit better up until now. But Chins is not a Big Ten caliber DC and I'd be shocked to see him coaching at a Power 5 school next season since he leaves with the lowest ranking in almost every statistical category in the conference. Mickey's already showing that he's a stronger head coach than Frost was just because he knows when it's time to move on. He's willing to make the tough decision even if it's not the popular one in the locker room. And he'll do what's right to make sure the team continues to fall forward and not take steps back. Bill Bush got promoted to run the defense so I'd assume he'll take over the safeties now too. Special teams is still to be determined, but they're in a much better place after a couple months under Bush anyway. And in the past, he was the DC at Northern Arizona, Utah State, and Rutgers, so who knows how good he'll be, but at this point, I can tell you with confidence, he's better than what we had. I expect him to work with Mickey on a new game plan that'll help the front line more since they've been getting worked up front and can't get any pressure. I'm not sure if adding a down lineman and taking the nickel away is going to help, but something fresh that teams can't pick apart as easy might be a good first step. I've seen some defensive guys decommit already, and I'm guessing more will over the next few weeks, but with this much change so fast and such a sad on-field performance in September, it's what you've got to expect. I walked by Malachi Coleman over in the corner of the stadium, and he was hanging out by himself in the third quarter. And in that moment, I just felt like recruiting was going to dip. He and the rest of the guys visiting wanted to see a competitive game between two historic rivals, and they got the opposite. It's like watching a high school kid take candy from a baby, and who would want to watch that for three hours? 
I'm guessing the vast majority of this class is gonna opt out unless the right coach comes in and in the final hour, he ends up signing a couple of those guys who really love Nebraska deep down. But at this point, I don't really care because we haven't seen this team that's full of three and four stars get very many wins. So if there's a coach out there who can win with walk-ons and guys who got overlooked, bring it on because they literally couldn't be anything worse than what we've been watching. I was in Lincoln this past weekend for the first time in a few years, and even though they got blown out, it was one of my best trips yet for a few reasons, but the first is because of how many supporters I ran into and how great it was getting to talk to everybody in person since it's usually just in the comments. We took a bunch of pictures over at Big Noon, in the stadium, at the hotel, in the bathroom, literally everywhere. And I think my favorite moment was seeing a dude on his phone walk right past me in the stadium wearing his corn craze merch and I had to smack him to make sure he saw me. But yeah, I had a pretty great time talking with everybody. Now for the best part of the trip, and I've got to give you a little background so you understand how it went down. A few months back, I became friends with one of the content creators on Nebraska's team after he started watching some of the videos on the channel. And we've been cool for a while now, so I told him one thing I had to do on this trip was to get my picture on the field. That was it. Just one picture, and I'd be straight. So Friday, he tells me to meet up with him at the stadium at 5.30, and we can knock it out. So my dad and I end up going over there. Oh, I ran into Marquise Buford in person out in front. That was cool. Trey Palmer for the second time. He's a nice guy. But anyway, then Jordan rolled up. He ends up giving my dad and I a tour of the entire facility in the stadium. And when I say the entire tour, I mean like two hours showing me everything, explaining his job, how he ended up in Lincoln, the whole deal. I even got my commitment picture ready to go. And as a diehard fan who rarely goes back to Lincoln, you can imagine how amazing that was. So I just wanted to say thank you to Jordan. And if you guys haven't seen his work or what he does, you got to go check his Instagram out. It's at it's JLit. The dude's photos are great, but his video edits are insane. And if you follow the Nebraska football page or any of the players, you've probably seen a bunch of his work already. But yeah, man, insane, insane weekend for a guy with a YouTube channel. I know there were a lot of people who didn't get to see me because I was moving around a lot, but I'm going to come back for the Wisconsin game in November, so maybe we can set up another meet and greet deal then because I love getting to talk to everybody. But that's all I've got for today, and the rest of the week is going to be all potential hire talk. So let me know in the comments below, are you fired up about Mickey's aggressive leadership or do you think he needs to slow his roll? And do you think Nebraska can still win some games with this new structure or are they too far gone for any positive return? I'm still excited to see what Mickey can get out of this team with a bye week and a new DC, but that's all I've got for you today. So until Tuesday, thank you for being here and I'll see you in the next one. Go Big Red.